Okay, well, thanks for coming, everyone. This is, uh, I've been on a bit of a tour around Europe, and this is the biggest meetup by far, which is great. So hopefully I'm the most polished by now. Um, just to get a little idea, was anyone here at FOSTEM and happened to see my talk as well? Okay. <laughs> so it's pretty similar to the talk I did there, so I'm glad it's not going to be repeating, repeating too much for anyone. Uh, so, right, I'm here to talk about the app container spec um, first, and then I'll go into a bit about uh, our implementation, uh, Rocket. Um, me, Jonathan Bull, uh, that's my avatar on various places, so you might see it around if you have a look at the repos. Um, John Bull on GitHub, Baron Bull on Twitter, um, which is where I, I, I used to work before CoreOS uh, for a few years. Uh, I've been at CoreOS about a year now. Uh, I started out working on Fleet, which is our distributed init system based around etcd and systemd, but most recently I've been sort of leading a lot of the development on Rocket um, and the app container spec. Um, for a little more background, I worked on something at Twitter, which was very similar to what Rocket <laughs> looks like today, um, but unfortunately that never ended up getting open sourced. So this is sort of our, our ne my next take, hopefully creating a, a big open source community. But first I want to talk about AppC itself. Um, so the app container specification, um, for anyone who's not familiar, it's, it's sort of a, a, a new specification we're proposing um, and that we want to be a community developed specification to define how applications can be run uh, in containers. Um, hopefully you're all somewhat familiar with what the idea of a container is. Um, but one of the whole reasons that we're creating this, this spec is that it is quite a nebulous term. Um, you know, on Linux, which is where we see some of the most popular implementations, uh, there's no such sort of underlying technology in the kernel of, of, of what a container is. So normally people use the term container to refer to groupings of different technologies like namespaces and C groups. Um, but there's not necessarily like a sort of common or, or, or standard uh, definition of, of what it actually is. And so as time, as new technologies emerge uh, in the kernel, um, you know, the definition of what a container is can change. So one of the things we really want to do is just have this, uh, this, this sort of, from first principles, this standard that people can kind of look at and agree on, and then they can develop their implementations based around these different technologies. So the AppC spec has a, a dedicated uh, GitHub uh, organization um, and a mailing list, which I encourage you to, to sort of take a look at. Okay, so what is the app spec? Well, I've already kind of gone through this, but um, it, it's a new open specification for running applications in containers. Um, just to sort of uh, disentangle it a bit from Rocket, um, we announced AppC and Rocket uh, together um, about uh, two months ago now, at the start of December. Um, but which at the time we did for sort of com for convenience, since we, you know, Rocket was originally the only implementation of the spec, um, so they were developed very closely together. Um, but you know, we had a very strong response from the community saying, uh, expressing that there was this uh, desire to, you know, have it as an open spec and develop completely separately from Rocket. Uh, so subsequently, we, you know, created this this uh, separate dedicated organization. Um, so it's not a it's not a CoreOS. Uh, CoreOS drives a lot of the development behind the project, but we want to make very clear that it's not a CoreOS uh, product uh, project. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about some of the principles that, um, you know, why are we doing this? What actually drove us to develop this spec in the first place? Uh, the first thing that's uh, very important to us, um, and I kind of touched on, is that it's, it's an open specification. Um, so it's independent from CoreOS, um, and also we really want it to a community develop around the spec itself. Um, as I said, we, we sort of drove the development, but um, even before we announced it, we had a lot of input from different parties um, working on their own sort of, you know, technologies around and projects around containers. Um, since we announced it um, and released it, we continued to get some really good contributions from, you know, for some, some very big parties, um, big technology companies, uh, but also many people in the, in the community itself, many individuals. Looking more at sort of the, the what's technically driving the spec uh, is that we want it to be simple, a simple specification to, to sort of understand and implement. So we don't want it to be, you know, thousands of pages of, of details about every little thing. We want it to be fairly easy, um, sort of taking a cue from the, the Golang guys. Ideally, the spec would be something that you could keep in your head as you're sort of working on it and thinking about it. But at the same time as it being simple, the flip side is we want there to be, you know, a lot of room to optimize so that the ultimate goal is that, you know, running containers and, and transferring containers and all these things can be done very quickly. Um, because obviously one of the whole promises of, of containers is that it's sort of more lightweight than traditional virtualization. So we need to design things in such a way that to facilitate that. Um, so one example I mentioned here is the idea of uh, 
being able to cache content, being able to cache uh, con sort of uh, application images, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and other sort of parts of the spec very aggressively in, in sort of proxy layers and, and things like that. The second uh, major thing that's on the technical side that's very important to us, um, at CoreOS in particular, since our whole sort of grand mission is to secure the internet, is security. Um, we want this to be something that people are thinking about from day one. Um, we want it to be the default behavior when working with, with applications, with working with containers. And so the sort of three key parts to the spec around this um, are the ideas of uh, image, image, addressing images, addressing applications, um, signing and encryption. So we want those to be, again, like in there from day one and basically the standard practice. Um, and then this third idea of, of container identity, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more when I talk about, uh, talk about how, we, how we describe that. The next part of the spec is that we want it to be standards-based. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, there's a lot of these technologies out there that are, are very sort of common and well-known and well-defined. Things like TAR, GZIP, GPG, HTTP, you know, so they're supported on almost any platform. Um, and since we want the spec to be sort of open and portable, uh, you know, that's quite important. But then coming back to what I said earlier about having this eye to optimization, uh, we want it to be extensible with more modern technologies. So, you know, using BitTorrent to transfer images instead of using HTTP, um, which might be much more efficient in some, some environments, um, or using, you know, more modern compression uh, algorithms like XZ instead of uh, GZIP. But the, the idea here is that the spec should really just be sort of the glue between these technologies, the way of, of coming up with these standards on how they interoperate, but we don't want to create you know, entirely new uh, things wherever possible. The other principle um, that uh, was very important to us in particular in CoreOS, and I'll talk about this more with, with Rocket, um, is the idea that the spec is composable. So when we define what a container is and what an application, con application image is, um, there should be, uh, it should integrate very well with existing systems that are already out there. Um, so one example I've talked about there is, is init systems and process managers. So we want to sort of limit the, spo the, the scope of the spec so that it can Im integrate with these things. Um, but even uh, talking about uh, transferring images. So since, you know, by default, we just define a simple HTTP uh, protocol uh, for discovering images, um, that should integrate very nicely with existing sort of uh, web setups, not have any sort of esoteric requirements. And then uh, the other thing there, coming back to it being sort of open spec, is that ultimately it should be uh, agnostic to, to OS, OS and uh, architecture. So although we're big users of Linux uh, at CoreOS, uh, we want the spec to be something that can, you know, define, it should be able to be defined in a reasonably high level way that it's feasible for others to implement it on very different platforms. So those are kind of the, the driving principles behind the spec, um, why we're working on it. Uh, and I want to talk about, now I'm going to talk about sort of how they're, you know, what we're actually prescribing. What does the spec consist of? Um, if anyone has any questions at any point, just raise your hand. So the first part of the spec, um, this is what a lot of people think about when they think about uh, application containers. And that's the image format. So that's how uh, applications are sort of stored on disk um, and how they can be transformed, uh, transferred around, I should say. So. Again, in keeping with our principles of sort of simplicity and, and standards, uh, what we're calling the application container image, um, it's a very simple, very simple format. It's just the tarball um, containing a root file system of the application, so the application binary, any of its libraries, and so forth, um, and then a manifest file, which is a short sort of JSON document describing the application. Um, another aspect of this is that uh, we we define the uh, so, the, so sort of the execution parameters, as if, if, if it was an application image to contain an application itself. Um, the, the section describing the uh, uh, execution parameters is optional. And what that means is if it's omitted, uh, then you can have an, uh, an image which provides, for example, just a set of files. So it doesn't necessarily describe an application itself. Um, and one really critical thing for us about the uh, application image format is that every uh, image has an ID. So the ID is, is just the cryptographic hash of the uh, tarball itself. And what that gives you is, uh, as long as you trust sort of the strength of the, the algorithm, it gives you a, a globally unique identifier um, for images. And so images are self-describing. So you can just have that image ID and you can uh, descri uniquely describe the bundle that that image uh, contains. Coming back to what I mentioned earlier about sort of caching being very important to us, for example, um, you know, this, this lends itself towards, you know, sort of a global store for images or, or something like that. 
The next um, important part of the spec, which we're also quite excited about, is this idea of image discovery. What we want to do here is, um, in keeping with our goal of the spec being sort of open, we want to define a, a mechanism that people can take a name of an image of an application um, and resolve that name and, and find an artifact somewhere on the internet. So here what we do is leverage sort of the existing DNS namespace. So we encourage people, it's not mandatory, but we encourage people to uh, name their, to when they name their app images, to use a name um, in the form of a DNS name, um, sort of scoped by a, uh, you know, by a domain under their control. So in the example, first example here, this would be, might be an HTTP server app that's owned by the organization example.com. Image discovery prescribes a process which can, will take that name and then convert it into uh, locations where the artifact corresponding to that uh, name can be retrieved. Um, it's a pretty simple system. Well, it's, I should say it's a pluggable system. Um, the, f the very basic one that we, we, uh, um, uh, that we first proposed is sort of around HTTPS and, and HTML. I'll, I'll show you a bit about that later. Um, but since it's pluggable, we also have uh, existing issues sort of discussing um, alternatives like uh, using DNS, um, different kinds of DNS records, um, or using uh, something like uh, well-known locations, which is an, R an HTTP RFC that I'd never heard about until someone brought it up at FOSDEM. But the whole idea there is that um, we want to provide this sort of experience of a federated namespace. So I can come to you and say, oh, if you want to run my etcd app, you can just run coreos.com slash etcd, and then implementations of the spec can take that and know how to, uh, how to determine where to actually locate that image. And, this, and the image's uh, signature, I should say. That's very important. So again, I'll show you what that actually looks like in a little bit. The next main component of the spec is, is the executor, or the runtime. Um, and that defines you know, what it looks like to, for an application to be running in a container. So the things that an application can expect uh, when it's running in a container that's conforming to the spec. So this is things like, uh, you know, simple thing, from simple things like environment variables, what environment variables it can expect, um, to isolators, which are you know, the actual containment part of containers. Um, so there, for example, we get, we're intending to define a well-specified you know, well set of, well-known set of isolators around you know, memory, CPU, and so forth. Um, and then the executor also defines the networking that's available to applications uh, that, are, that are running in the, in the spec. And uh, networking is, is a pretty complicated issue. And so uh, in the spec, we're taking quite a sort of a simple agnostic view to that. Um, what we've defined there is that uh, applications running in a container uh, are provided an L3 device rather than an L2, so they're provided an IP essentially. Um, and this ties into the idea of container identity, which I, I'll talk about in a second, um, which is, is, is something new we're kind of trying to propose. So where container identity comes in is this idea of a metadata server. Um, if any of you, you know, are users of sort of AWS or DigitalOcean, you might be familiar with this already. The idea here is that there's a, a, a trusted service that's available to applications running in the containers or in VMs in the AWS world, for example. Um, that server is available at a, at a well-known endpoint, um, which we've defined as being passed in on, a, on, a, um, on an environment variable. Um, and that metadata server provides a couple of key things. One is information about the container th that the application is running in. So for example, the application could uh, inspect this uh, metadata and determine, oh, I'm running in this DC or on maybe on this server or so forth. And then the other, the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other endpoint that, we're t that we uh, prescribe is this idea of an ent uh, identity endpoint. And what that means is that um, since every container has a unique identity, um, it can use this, this endpoint to, uh, and, and the idea that the metadata service is, sorry, the knowledge that the metadata server is trusted, it can use this endpoint to sign some data, just using a simple HMAC signature. And then when it's communicating with other applications, other containers, uh, it can provide that signature along with you know, the data payload that it's communicating. And then since that container trusts its metadata server, uh, it can uh, verify, the, uh, verify the signature on the data is correct. Um, so we're, we're trying to bring the, yeah, this idea of identity, which is sort of exists, you know, has existed in the VM world. We're trying to bring it to the application container world, world as well. Whoops. Um, Okay, so that was, very briefly, sort of the, the, the four main parts of the spec. Um, as I said, it's all up on GitHub, so I encourage you to go and look at all the details um, if you're more interested. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the tooling that's, that's uh, come out, that's around the spec to kind of work with it. 
The first tool, which is, uh, so our command line tool is called AC tool. We're developing this alongside the spec at the moment, but you know, in future that will be separated out. And this is a pretty simple tool, and it's really just our first, you know, first prototype of something to build ACIs, you know, which is one of the first questions that people often ask. How can I build this? How can I actually use it? So the idea here is it's very simple. It just simply takes a rootfs, like I mentioned earlier, that contains, uh, might just contain some, some files on disk, or it might contain an actual application um, and, and a binary and sort of all the required libraries. And it takes an image manifest, which describes, an uh, describes the image, and it just bundles them up into an ACI. Coming back to the idea of the spec being, uh, you know, based around these standard tools, really this is doing nothing more than sort of tarring it up and, and maybe gzipping it and adding a signature. But the next tool, which is a little subcommand, which is a little more important, is, is validate. Um, and the idea here is that we want to be able to be able to provide this to people who are implementing the spec themselves, and for them to be able to validate, yes, what we're doing is correct. Um, so. It's a pretty simple tool. It'll just take uh, an application container image that you provide it and sort of run through and check that all the requirements that are outlined in the spec you know, are fulfilled by this artifact. Um, the other tool, which I haven't actually mentioned here, um, is to validate. So that validates the Im that people comply with sort of the image format. Another, another tool which is quite important is uh, what we call the uh, application container executor verifier, I think. And the idea there is that this is an, is, is an ACI itself, which you can run within your implementation of the executor, and that will make sure that the executor environment is set up correctly. So for example, that will look at things like environment variables, uh, will look for uh, any mount points that were specified that it expects to see, um, and it will do a validation of the metadata server that, it's, that it expects to find there as well. Um, AC tool discover is a very simple, uh, just an example implementation, basically of the of the discovery specification. So as I mentioned earlier, that's just a way of resolving an app name to a uh, to a uh, to a URL in this case, where that app app can be actually retrieved. Um, so that's some of the kind of some of the uh, upstream, I guess, tooling that we've been developed de developing as we're working on the spec. Um, but pretty soon after we announced the spec, we had a lot of great projects emerge in the community. Um, and I want to talk a bit about those before I talk about Rocket. Um, the, first, uh, the first thing that, uh, one thing that came out quite early was, was a C++ library for working with app containers. So um, at CoreOS, you know, we work almost exclusively in Go with a bit of C. Um, so most of our tooling that we wrote around the spec and, the, and sort of the AC tool is all written in Go. Um, other people have different preferences for li languages, and that's great. That's something we want to encourage um, is you know, that the spec is agnostic, so it can be worked with by a whole bunch of different tooling and different native tooling, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, so CD Aylward on, this is a GitHub repo, just to sort of clarify how I'm referring to these projects, um, created a C++ library for working with app containers. Um, and then in the last couple of days, he's actually released a very early version of an executor. So this is completely separate from Rocket, but it sort of mim mimics it a little bit uh, in terms of some of the early behaviors. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a it's a, an early implementation of the spec um, for running app containers that's completely separate from from what we'd worked on. And as a side note to that, um, I know Mesos is is a very popular project. Um, for disclaimer, I kind of worked on Mesos at Twitter. Um, not that I would necessarily encourage you or discourage you from using it, but do your own research. But uh, for those interested in Mesos. Um, it's looking likely that they will leverage that library, uh, the C++ library, to uh, implement app containers within Mesos, which is really exciting to see. So then we would have first-class support uh, sort of for Mesos uh, tasks of being app containers. The next project I want to mention, which was really exciting to see, um, is something called Jetpack. And uh, the idea there is that this is a completely different uh, implementation of the spec, completely different technology from what we'd expected. Um, as we develop the spec, since we are a Linux distribution, and we spent all of our time on Linux. Um, we actually, in early versions of the spec, we had sort of limited uh, some of the, for example, the the, uh, the valid uh, OS and architecture to Linux AMD 64, since that's all we developed on. And we kept those as fit parameters, so that we anticipated that people would sort of eventually come along and other implementations would emerge. But almost immediately, uh, MPAS the Nucky started submitting you know, issues and requests, sort of saying, well, hey, what's going on? I'm trying to work on this other implementation on FreeBSD, and why isn't it valid? Um, so 
he's been really invaluable in sort of keeping us on our toes and making sure that as we develop the spec from the beginning that it's totally agnostic um, to these different environments. Um, he's also in the audience tonight if anyone's interested in, in meeting with him. So again, this is a really exciting project. Um, it's exactly the kind of thing we'd hope for when designing the spec. So it's great to see things like this happening so early. Another tool that came out a week or two ago, um, which was originally developed outside, but we've since moved it into the AppSea rep repo, um, is Docker to ACI, which does pretty much what it sounds like. Um, it's a command line tool, and it's also a library. Um, so the basic idea is you provide it with an existing uh, Docker repository, uh, Docker image, and it will convert it to an uh, image that implements the spec. There's two, two kind of ideas here. One is that a lot of people um, already have you know, pretty well-established workflows around working with uh, Docker images. And so for those people, we want to provide them with a good way to you know, work with the spec, to play, to play with it. We also are really uh, interested in, in uh, interoperability between um, Docker and the spec. Um, we created the spec you know, because the Docker one that wasn't necessarily as well, spe well specified. Um, subsequently, a specification has emerged, um, but we're still sort of still, uh, so we're, we're still interested in sort of interoperating there, um, if possible. Um, another tool that I released after hacking on a train to Munich the other day, um, very, very early tool. I'm not trying to uh, pimp myself here, but I want to use this as an example of kind of the direction we want to go towards. Um, and the idea here is that, um, you know, Docker file, so with, in working with a container system like Docker, um, there's sort of one prescribed, well set uh, uh, means of producing images, which is from the Docker file. And that's great. That works very well for a lot of people. Um, but with the spec, we want to take quite a different approach. It's a bit of a paradigm shift. And we want to move towards, instead of the idea of sort of, uh, creating things using this, this workflow and, base, for example, basing them off uh, you know, Ubuntu image, which is quite a common pattern. We want to have uh, native language tooling for building uh, app images, app container images, wherever possible. So again, since we're familiar with Go, this is a very easy place to start. Um, since Go supports uh, stati static compilation quite easily, so it's very, uh, very trivial to create, generate a binary which doesn't have you know, sort of complex dependencies. So this is a very simple tool which would just take a repository um, that needs to be uh, you know, buildable using go get, for example, um, pull that repository down, build it in a fairly clean environment, um, and wrap the uh, resulting binary into a, something that implements the spec using some of the libraries that we developed along with the spec. Um, so that's just, that's just really an example right now of how we, see, how we see this, how the direction we see this going. Um, so you, can, you could conceive, you could think of um, other examples might be if you have a JVM app, like if you're working around the JVM, um, you'd have a very simple plugin to um, whatever your JVM build happens to be, maybe Maven or Ant or Gradle. Um, and when you're doing your project build, you would do sort of, you know, for example, Gradle set output ACI, build project, and that would spit out an ACI that you can then run on any implementation of the spec. Uh, similarly, for people who are big users of config management systems like Puppet or Chef, um, we would expect to see something like you know, Puppet, output ACI, uh, apply this manifest to this directory or something like that. Um, that's how we want, uh, that's really what, how we want um, ACI building to work with the spec, where it's as close, wherever possible, it's as close as possible to sort of the source, uh, the source tooling. And it's very easy for people to write their own implementations with their own, you know, the work with their own workflows. So those are some of the projects around the spec, um, but there's sort of more coming out every day. Um, those are just some of the highlights. So what's actually happening with the spec itself? Um, we announced it two months ago, it's still very much in development, um, but it is stabilizing. Um, so at the moment, we're sort of calling it V0.3.0, plus some changes uh, since then. I think we announced that last week. Um, we're hoping to reach the point in the next uh, couple of weeks where we can just tell people to go out and just build against it. Like, we're pretty happy with where it is. It might change, but please, like, just go, go crazy. Um, a lot of the projects that have emerged already have been really interesting to see that, that people are willing to, to be on the bleeding edge. And so it shows that there's a lot of interest and demand in this stuff, which is great. Some of the main areas that we still need to sort of finalize, um, I have here pods isolate as best practices. So pods, which I didn't talk about earlier, um, the idea there is that we want to, one of the new, the novel things in the spec, or relatively not novel, but one of the uh, important aspects of the spec is that we want to change uh, the fundamental unit, the fundamental deployable unit 
um, in it that runs in a container from a single application to a group of applications. Um, this has been sort of popularized recently by the Kubernetes team at Google um, with their idea of the pod, and I think they have a pretty good definition of it. Um, and so we have, we're considering you know, using a similar definition, but we don't want to overload the term. Um, but the idea there is that, uh, sort of the insight there is that it's a very common pattern to run a group of applications together, whether that's sort of your main application um, and a sidekick that does announcing for service discovery, um, or maybe you have a little, uh, you have a, a, a backup daemon running alongside your database or something like that. And we want to encapsulate that in the spec as the first class citizen. So um, that's that's something that we, we uh, that's very important to us about the spec. Um, we still need to figure out the exact semantics about how those are specified, so that's why I said it's a to-do. Another aspect is just um, sort of settling on that, that set of well-known isolators. Um, so the idea with isolators is that they're, they're optional, but we want they're and it's sort of extensible. So we're actually proposing, um, even within the isolators, that people excuse me, um, name, namespace them. So if they're going to implement their own isolators, that they namespace them with their, within their own uh, domain name, for example. But we do want to settle on a, on a set of standard and sort of common isolators that we would expect most executives to implement. Um, and then finally, best practices um, is an area. We, we have a lot of people coming up to us and saying, you know, well, uh, you know, for example, since you're based around tar, tar is not like a very efficient format necessarily. Um, how can we, you know, provide things in an efficient? W how can we uh, uh, start containers in an efficient way if we're relying on images to be tar files? Um, and our answer to that would be, well, that's what we say in the spec. That's what we just define in the spec as sort of the common denominator. But actual implementations can have all kinds of implementations. So, uh, sorry, optimizations. So, for example, rather than storing just the tar file on disk, you could explore the uh, exploded version of the tar file on disk, um, and then be able to reassemble it if necessary. And then, when launching a new container, you would, for example, bind mount that. Uh, sorry, use your um, overlay system like overlay fs uh, to to provide that into the container without having to unpack the tar every time. So there's a few different things like that that we we need to we want to put put into the uh, alongside the spec to sort of guide people as they're working with it. Um, and that's yeah that's about it for the spec itself. Um, so before I go on to talk about Rocket, does anyone want to ask anything about the spec? What I just went through? Yes. What about the layered file systems uh, in um, in the FCE spec? Mm -hmm. Do you consider these not a good practice or? Uh, are they supported mm -hmm. in some way? Um, do you mean within sort of the definition of an image itself, or yes. yeah? Sounds like mm -hmm. there's only one root of us and there's no uh, mm -hmm. need for layering. Anyway. So what we have there, we've kind of went gone back and forth on that. What we've ended up at with is uh, a set of uh, the idea of a dependency. So an application image can uh, have a set of dependencies, which it then the spec prescribes are then layered into the file system that's created for the container. So that is that is supported. And then we would expect. Again, um, different implementations to use different technologies to achieve that. So within CoreOS, um, we intend on using OverlayFS, um, which has only just become available in the mainstream kernel. So that's unfortunately we couldn't. I'm sorry. Oh, 318. Thanks. So unfortunately we couldn't provide that sort of out of the box. But that's something we intend to use, um, and we would expect, for example, the uh, FreeBSD implementation I mentioned earlier was going to use something like ZFS. Um, does that address the question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. So I'll go and talk about Rocket. Um, what is Rocket? Rocket is a CoreOS project, um, and it's an implementation of the spec. It's the first implementation, but as I've kind of been trying to stress, it shouldn't be the only implementation. Um, and specifically, it implements the these three key parts of the spec: the the discovery, um, although it leverages a lot of sort of upstream of, of code from the spec repo for that. Um, it is an it, it is an executor. That's how most people are going to think of it. It's a runtime, and then Rocket ha itself has an implementation of the metadata server that I talked about. Um, although that could, in principle, be sort of stripped out from Rocket and, and used separately. Rocket is written in Go and it runs targeted at Linux. Um, but specifically, it's not targeted at uh, CoreOS Linux. So we have developers on Fedora. Uh, I run Fedora. We have developers on Ubuntu and Debian. Um, we want it to be self-contained and sort of portable across these different systems. Um, in particular, it's, it's agnostic to init systems. So at CoreOS, we're big users of SystemD. We're big fans of SystemD. Um, but obviously, 
uh, not everyone is, um, and some distributions aren't using it. So um, Rocket should work fine out of the box on you know an upstart system, for example. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, but that's not necessarily to say that it will, uh, we, we expect that on so in some cases we'd provide sort of enhanced uh, capabilities maybe on a systemd system. So some of you, for those of you who are familiar with systemd, you might be aware of like the machines concept, so machine CTL for example. So we expect uh, rocket uh, containers to be uh, c fully compatible with that concept. Um, Rocket is CLI only. This is one of its slightly defining uh, architectural features. So there's no long-running daemon, there's no API that Rocket exposes. Um, the really important implication here is that when you run a container in Rocket, it runs directly underneath the process tree of, of Rocket itself, directly underneath this morning process. Actually, I think as of today, it's still actually execing over the top of Rocket, although that might change slightly in future. But this is very important to us. Um, if you run Rocket on the command line from Bash, the application starts directly underneath it. If you run it under, happen to be using Run It, the application starts directly underneath it. If you run it under Systemd, as I just mentioned, um, the application runs directly underneath Rocket. This is very important because any uh, any Systemd sort of constraints, for example, so Systemd memory limit that you want to apply to to a Rocket process, applies to the application itself. Um, as I mentioned, we're big users of Systemd. Um, and I worked on Fleet, which is sort of our um, basic um, distributed scheduler for Systemd. We've had a lot of issues with um, at CoreOS with uh, customers using uh, Docker with uh, Systemd because of this kind of thing. Because uh, any constraints that you apply to Docker through the Systemd unit file, you know, they're actually only applying to the Docker, Docker client. They're not applying to the container itself that gets started by the daemon. So this is one of our sort of primary motivations here. Um, as I mentioned, Rocket should work fine on upstart systems. So again, any kind of control, any process control or, or limits or anything applied through uh, upstart will apply to the application, apply to the container. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about how Rocket works internally. Um, we actually, even though we're quite opinionated about Rocket and we you know, encourage people to develop their own executives, we, even with, within Rocket itself, we want it to be somewhat modular. Um, and so. What this means is that when you run a container, when you execute a container, the execution is divided into stages. Um, and the idea is that these stages should be somewhat swappable. So the first stage of Rocket, which we probably wouldn't expect people to swap, but uh, is stage zero. And that's just the binary itself. So that's the command line. Um, so that's responsible in the, in the execution process. That's responsible for uh, discovering applications, um, for pulling them down to disk, for uh, writing, you know, writing them out to the file system, things like that. But then things, when things, where things get a little more interesting is stage one. Um, stage one encapsulates uh, the execution environment for apps. So since, as I mentioned earlier, we define uh, a container in the, in the, in the AppC spec to consist potentially of multiple apps, um, we, we need this environment in which those multiple apps will share. Um, so in Rocket, this looks like uh, a file system for the uh, container itself that contains these multiple applications within, each with their own respective root file system, um, and an init binary, um, which is controls the process lifecycle of these uh, apps. So we have some, uh, within the spec, when you're defining an app, there's a couple of very simple uh, lifecycle hooks. So for example, a pre-start, which will happen before the application does, and a post-stop when the application stops. In Rocket, these are controlled, these are sort of um, handled by the init binary that's running within the container. Uh, the stage one's also responsible for, yeah, for as I said, for managing those processes, and then also for setting up like individual constraints uh, on the things and also for providing access from the containers to the uh, metadata service. So um, as an example, I mentioned that uh, all, all uh, uh, applications running an, in, in an executor conforming to the spec expect to have an L3 device. So the stage one would be responsible for any sort of networking magic necessary to connect that, uh, L to create that L3 device and uh, make that metadata service available. So that might be, you know, some IP tables rules or something. Um, might be more complicated routing if you were to use a centralized metadata service that wasn't local to the node. Um, at the moment, within Rocket, we just do, yeah, we expect a, a local, um, a local metadata service. So one of the well, stage two itself is, is literally just the execution of the app. So that's the apps um, running within that outer container with their various constraints applied, and they start off uh, within their root file system. So they can, you know, they can have well-known paths to all of their, their files and such. 
coming back to talking about stage one being um, swappable, um, the idea there is that so our default uh, implementation that we ship with Rocket um, is actually systemd based. So it uses systemd within the container to control the processes. Um, we find that works very well. Um, but totally understand that people might want uh, want to explore alternatives. Um, to give you an example of some more interesting alternatives, um, we have people working on stage one, which actually spins up a VM using you know QMU and, and KVM, and then the container, you know, the application containers running within the VM, um, but still conforming to the spec. So we have a couple of people, yeah, investigating some some really interesting alternatives there. Uh, for example, if you you know if you some of the the, the uh, security primitives, for example, around VMs are considered to be a little more robust than some of the built-in Linux kernel features. So for some environments, that's definitely an attra attractive alternative. So two months ago, we announced at launch, we announced v0.1.0. Um, it was very limited. There wasn't really much that Rocket could do at the time. It could fetch images. So this was, again, our example of showing, like, how is image discovery actually going to work? What does that mean? Um, so in the first example here, it's just going to pull, Rocket's just going to pull it directly from a URL. But in the second example, it's going to use this image discovery mechanism, which I'll, I'll show you in a second, to find out, you know, where it should get the app by that name and by this tag. Um, and then Rocket just uses a very simple content addressable store on disk to store, uh, to store any artifacts it retrieves. The other command that Rocket supported was Rocket Run. So that would uh, transitively fetch um, an application image uh, if you run it by this sort of this first this discovery form or by URL. It also handled running uh, applications you know locally from disk or referencing them by that image ID, which I talked about earlier. So that's that global you know unique uh, image ID. So in this case, um, Rocket expects that image ID to be available in its local CAS, but you can also imagine uh, alternative implementations, or maybe even a future implementation of Rocket, uh, where that would be looking into a shared CAS. So it's not necessarily local on disk, but maybe a, a CAS that your environment's providing over the network somewhere, maybe HDFS or some kind of blob store, um, where it could retrieve images from there as well with you know guaranteed unique identifier. Uh, so since then, we're at Rocket v031 as of a couple of days ago. Um, things quietened down a little bit over the Christmas period since we announced just before then, but uh, we still made pretty good progress, so I want to talk a bit about some of the new stuff. Rocket gained a bunch of new commands, some of them which arguably should have been there from the beginning. Um, but, uh, you know, these are some of the things you would expect to see in any, in any kind of container system. The first two, pretty straightforward, do hopefully what you'd probably expect. Um, Rocket Enter allows you to enter an application's uh, environment that's running within a container and just sort of interact with it. So interact with its root file system um, and you're running within the namespaces that the container is existing in. List is a very straightforward listing of you know what containers are running on the system. Um, are they active or not? But I do want to talk a little bit more about status and GC because again, these probably do what you'd expect, but the implementation is, is what's a little more interesting. So since we don't have a long-running daemon in Rocket, so there's nothing, you know, coordinating state, there's no central uh, central daemon coordinating state, we, you know, we need to design from the beginning for Rocket to be invoked multiple times simultaneously um, and to for how those are going to interact and not interfere with each other and step on each other. So, for example, when running Rocket status, we need to be able to, uh, you know, in an atomic fashion, uh, be able to check the status of an application without, you know, without doing sort of racy things like writing a PID file and reading a PID file or so forth. Similarly, with GC, we want to make sure that we only collect garbage collect applications that have actually stopped uh, containers that have actually stopped running. So we do this using a pretty simple uh, file-based locking package. Um, so there, the idea is that we we want to use the kernel to guarantee to provide these guarantees for us. Um, so, for example, when you start running a Rocket application, uh, c Rocket container, um, it will take a, just a simple flock on the directory that contains the container, and then subsequently, any commands you run, like a status uh, or like a GC, will attempt to take uh, you know an advisory lock on that um, uh, on that uh, container directory, and depending on the you know the success of the lock or not, they'll know whether the container is still running um, or whether it can be garbage collected. The other, taking a diff different track completely, the other um, command I want to talk about is Rocket Trust. Um, I mentioned here that, I mentioned much earlier that security is very important to us um, and we want, uh, we want signing to be like a first class citizen in, in, the in the spec and in implementations of the spec. Uh, 
So with Rocket, what this means is that um, when retrieving images using uh, the discovery process, uh, we want them to be uh, to expect that there's a signature available and to look for that signature by default and prov and uh, do a signature validation by default. So trust is just a command that we added to to try and make this process a little easier to work with. Um, so the idea here is that you can you can tell Rocket to trust. Um, again, going back to the idea of uh, the namespace using this federated DNS namespace for image management, you can tell Rocket that you want to trust um, a particular prefix, so a particular DNS prefix, um, and it will then uh, use discovery to find the public key for that prefix, and then locally register that you know it wants to trust that key for any images starting with this prefix. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, or you might want, <coughs> excuse me, you might just want to trust a particular key, like your local key, for uh, for everything. So in this case, it, the, if you use it with dash dash root, it will install that key to trust all images. Um, another change that happened in the last week or so um, is coming back to the idea of the stage one being modular. Previously, we uh, constructed a stage one and did something a bit hacky, which was bundle it into Rocket itself, into the stage zero. Um, and the motivation there was we wanted something very easy for people to sort of download and be able to play with and very simple, so because it was a single binary. But um, obviously, it's not ideal for many reasons. One of which was that it wasn't. It meant that the stage one wasn't easily swappable, and people needed to uh, do this sort of custom build, including a vow stage one rootfs, in order to actually run Rocket at all. Now, what we've done is is uh, change the stage one to when Rocket uh, is looking for a stage one, it just expects to consume an ACI, um, just another ACI. So, sort of eating its own dog food in a way. Um, that. That ACI has to f has to follow a pretty simple format, like it, it needs to contain the root file system for the container, um, and it needs to provide the init binary that I talked about a little bit earlier. So again, that makes it much easier to swap out execution environments, swap out stage ones, um, but also it makes it uh, much friendlier to package Rocket for different um, for different distributions. So um, Fedora was uh, expressed interest in packaging Rocket for Fedora from a very early stage, for example, um, but it's basically a non-starter to have this big binary blob. Um, and also because this our stage one happens to be derived from CoreOS, um, you know, that's not something that they wanted to put inside a package of Rocket that was going to go in Fedora. So instead, what you'll see is that, um, I believe they're still actively working on this, is generating their own stage one based on Fedora sources, so they can, ha they can verify that entire chain from you know, source to the stage one binary. Um, and you'll see that packaged instead. Um, so I wanted to give a quick cat crash course in Rocket. Hopefully if the internet is on my side. Uh, okay, so can everyone see the text okay at the back? Yeah, great. Yeah, sure. So this is a bit just a basic, you know, hopefully give you a basic example of what using Rocket looks like and, and show you a little bit more detail about some of the aspects that I talked about. So we can see here, you know, top level rocket has a few commands that we, that we talked about. Um, so let me just make sure that I don't have anything cached. All right, so the first thing I want to try and do oops, is fetch an image. So as I mentioned earlier, the idea here is that it will just uh, use the discovery process to find out where to retrieve the image and pull it down. So I gave it this tag, um, oh sorry, this name, corosscom slash etcd, and then I provided it with a, uh, a version label, um, v2.0.0. It, oh, <laughs> so it took that name and that, that version, and it uh, ended up with this URL from which it's retrieving the image. So how did it do that? So the first thing that it did was uh, it took that, that application name of coreos.com slash etcd, um, and it prepended HTTPSS, HTTPS, excuse me. And then it just tried to reach that URL. Uh, that URL is a 404. So coming back to this idea of it being a hierarchical uh, namespace, we, it'll simply, the next thing it'll do is try and walk up the tree. So in this case, coreos.com, which loads quite fast. Then it inspects the uh, HTML that's served in that page. And it's looking for a special uh, meta tag, or a couple of meta tags. The AC discovery meta tag, and the AC discovery pub keys meta tag. 
So, oops. The idea here is that um, it provides a simple template that the client can then use. So any client. So in this case, Rocket. But since this is prescribed in the spec itself, you know, other implementations should you should should also work with this. Um, it will take that template substitute in these values so um, you know version was that tag we gave it um, OS and arc for rocket that happens to be you know uh, AMD 64 uh, Linux but you can imagine other implementations would substitute their own version and then the extension so the extension in the first case is ACI since we're just trying to get the actual image itself um, but then uh, the alternative uh, that it could submit, that, that it, sorry, that it would substitute would be for the signature when it's looking for the signature corresponding to that image. Um, and then we have AC discovery uh, pub keys, which is coming back to what I was talking about earlier with that trust command of telling it how do I trust this domain? Like, what should it, where should I find the public key ring that uh, signs images from that domain? So, <laughs> let's see. Yes. In this particular case, yes. Um, yeah, we're still considering the exact semantics around uh, providing a more, uh, providing sort of maybe a wildcard here, for example. But for now, we're just serving etcd. Um, for those of you wondering why we're doing this stuff with meta tags, we've, it's an idea that was inspired by um, Golang and their idea of sort of having uh, vanity import paths, so where you can reference a pack Golang package from different um, from a different uh, different domain name, for example. Um, and as you can see, we're just, for convenience, we're just hosting our, uh, hosting the binary on GitHub itself. But the idea here is that we're trusting um, the DNS namespace and, you know, TLS. Um, but obviously, different implementations might be even stricter and might not, might not necessarily uh, use discovery at all. I'm going to jump forward and talk about what's coming. So, as I said, Rocket's at 3.3.1 right now. Talk a little bit about what's, what's on the near-term roadmap. Um, one thing that will probably land very soon is uh, native Docker image support. So this is taking advantage of that uh, library I talked about earlier, Docker to ACI, um, so that uh, Rocket is actually able to natively run based on a, you know, using some sort of syntax like this, for example. Um, it will actually reach out to a Docker repository, um, pull down the image, uh, convert it to an ACI in, in sort of real time, and then actually run that uh, as, a, as an application. Uh, let me just see how this is going. OK, great, failed. Um, <laughs> Hey, why are you laughing? That's exactly what we want. <laughs> uh, the error message could be clearer, but how does Rocket know how to trust this image? It doesn't, because we haven't told it to trust anything yet. And again, this is coming back to the idea of we want to be secure by default. We want to be doing like slightly paranoid and doing these things by default. So unfortunately, we're going to have to go through that download again. But uh, the idea here is that we need to tell Rocket, hey, um, this domain has made its uh, keys available, public key available through the uh, through the meta tags that I just oops uh, through the meta tag that I showed you through this uh, discovery pub keys tag. So hmm, that's interesting. Rocket itself, with this debugging information printing for some reason, um, knows how to discover that that public key. So it can reach out and do that. And then it can prompt us, like, here's the actual key that coreos.com slash etcd is providing. Are you sure we want to trust this? Obviously, this is the point at which you all go and manually verify that fingerprint. I'm going to skip past that and just tell it, yes, trust this key um, specifically for that prefix. So specifically for any names that we're discovering that start with that prefix, coreos.com slash etcd. Um, what Rocket does is then it uh, writes it into a file here. I'm just going to fetch that. Um, and the idea here is that we, we, again, we use this sort of prefix-based system. Um, so this is telling Rocket, um, hey, use this key to trust anything that starts with the name coreos.com slash etcd. But you could imagine that I could also install it for uh, anything starting with coreos.com if I want it to be a little less granular. Or I could install it for, mm, forgot the tag. Or I could install it for the root prefix if I wanted to trust that key for absolutely everything. So, actually, I'm just going to change that to a run. Uh, 
let me go back to talking about what's coming in Rocket. Um, networking, which I haven't really talked about beyond just saying, again, the, in the spec itself, it's just going to provide that layer 3 device. Um, so in Rocket, we uh, the, the implementation is still in progress, but it's shaping up nicely. Um, and the idea there is there we're going for a very extensible system, uh, a plugin-based system. Um, so, for example, when you start a container in Rocket, um, it'll, it'll, it can run a configurable plugin. You know, we'll ship with some default plugins. I think now we have uh, sort of IP VLAN and Mac VLAN ones, um, and then maybe one to inter integrate with uh, Open vSwitch or something like that. Uh, but anyone can create their own plugin, um, and then that plugin is responsible for you know setting up the network and basically giving an IP address uh, that, that, the, that Rocket can assign to the container. Um, again, because the, the idea here is that everyone has, you know, very, ha everyone has their own view on networking. Um, many environments have very esoteric particular requirements. Um, as I mentioned, I used to work in Twitter, and at Twitter, uh, every uh, every rack was assigned only a slash twenty four, uh, which we got really limiting when it came to um, doing things like containers and VMs, because. Uh, you know, every every rack being limited to uh, 255 addresses means you can't really fit. You can't really give unique IPs to containers, and so in the end, you end up working around it with these all kinds of uh, uh, sort of port mapping systems and this kind of stuff, which we're trying to trying to avoid. Um, something else coming soon, coming soon, uh, with Rocket is integration with Kubernetes. Um, this is really exciting to us. Um, we're big fans of the Kubernetes project. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, you should check it out. Um, and there's an open issue in Kubernetes about implementing uh, Rocket, Rocket support as a sort of a first-class citizen. Um, the Google guys themselves are so swamped with sort of getting Kubernetes 1.0 out the door that they're probably not going to work on it directly. But there's a few people in the community that are uh, that are as sort of going to step up and, and deliver that, which is really great. <coughs> okay, whoops, missed it. Um, great, so. Here we can see at the top I did a run instead of a fetch. Um, and this time it just did it transitively did the fetch um, using the same process. Downloaded the image, downloaded the signature, and hooray! It verified the signature and that worked fine since we trusted that signature. It's trusted the public key uh, corresponding to that signature. And now we see this is what etcd looks like running in Rocket. Um, pretty straightforward. So now you can all applaud. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So that's, come on, that's it, uh, basically, that's all I have for now. Um, but we definitely encourage you all to get involved. Um, you know, have a look at the repos, have a look at the spec itself, or have a look at Rocket. Um, we have a lot of, on both repos, we have sort of a help wanted label on GitHub, um, which are great places to start. Some of them are very simple, some of them are much more complex kind of features we're considering. Um, and yeah, I'd like to open it up to questions. Yes. No. So to be clear, um, it uses System D within within the stage one within Rocket itself, but it doesn't need it on the system at all. So it doesn't actually, as of today, it does not interact with the host System D at all. Um, in future, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you can expect some to see some integration. So we want, for example, when a Rocket container runs, for it to register if there's a host System D to register with that System D's machine D. Then you'll be able to do things like. Um, uh, you know, machine CTL list, which again doesn't work today, but you will see rocket containers in here as, as sort of first class citizens. So the idea there is we want to limit the scope of what rocket controls and integrate with these these things which are already kind of well established wherever possible. Uh, the rocket stage one that we ship bundles the system D. Um, to give you an example of what that actually looks like, uh, where is it? I think it's in stage one. Oop, yep. So this is our, for example, this is our stage one that we ship with Rocket, um, which contains a pretty minimal system D environment. Um, but as I said, this is just an ACI itself. So if you run Rocket, uh, I think with yeah with you know the stage one image flag, you can provide it any any ACI that implements the stage one. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, that's an into the question was are there any 
projects that I know of to, to plan to implement the AppSea spec on Mac OS. Uh, no, none that I know of. Um, within Rocket, we expect some features will work on OS X. Um, actually, all the developers right now are on Linux, so we're not great about keeping that compatibility, but um, we'd expect some things like Fetch and Discover to kind of work on OS X so people can play around with it. In terms of the execution itself, I wouldn't, yeah, I'm, it's way outside my uh, <laughs> knowledge zone. Uh, yeah, th that's a good point. You could certainly see something like that yeah, happening. Uh, any other questions? Do you want to ask another one, Peter? <laughs> okay. No one? Oh, yes. So the question was that we concerned with fragmentation with different implementations of stage one and that we wouldn't necessarily agree on the right on the same feature set, maybe, and that it would slow development, I guess? Or, yeah, or main production for Rocket. Or make it up. Okay. Um, yeah, people want the maximum feature set and only use one implementation of the others. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little early to say. I mean, I think we would expect anyone using, we would expect most the average user of Rocket to probably just use the stage one that ships with Rocket. Um, we're definitely going to tighten up what that contract is between stage zero and stage one um, and what exactly stage one is responsible for. Um, and I mean, ideally, all, all of that is really comes out in the spec itself. So the stage one is, you know, it doesn't necessarily provide, maybe in some cases provides additional features, but the features should be driven through the st spec wherever possible. So as long as the stage one uh, is a valid implementation of the spec, then, yeah. Yes? Okay, the question was, uh, what would or wouldn't be possible if Rocket was to provide a long-running daemon? Um, <laughs> Well, let's see. I mean, it's, it's kind of an open-ended question, right? As l once you start providing a daemon, you can provide all kinds of things. Um, we explicitly don't want to because we think that the scope should be limited. Um, we think so it can integrate with existing systems that already deal with a lot of this stuff and are specializing in this stuff. So for example, um, System D takes care of a lot of this stuff for you, and we think we should leverage that rather than trying to compete with it necessarily. Um, once you have a daemon, uh, controlling processes like this, it becomes very hard to interact with other systems and really limits your yeah limits limits your ability to integrate with existing systems. Um, even with uh, something like um, different uh, uh, container orchestration systems like uh, Fleet or Mesos or Kubernetes, um, whenever the, the it's always a little bit awkward for them interacting with a d daemon the way that they want to the way that they want to work. They really want to control the whole process tree. Um, it just causes headaches Headaches if they have to delegate to a daemon. Um, things that that means we don't provide is that, uh, yeah, we don't provide an API, and it's very unlikely we provide an API. We could be, instead, we would expect that to be handled at a different layer. So the Kubernetes API for people to interact with, for example, scheduling rocket containers. Um, one thing it does buy us, is, uh, which is pretty cool, is, is we can do upgrades in place. Um, by and large, so since there's no daemon, we don't have to worry about restarting the daemon, which at the moment, you know, will generally kill all the things that the daemon's running. Um, yeah, it's just another rocket's just within the process, so it can just stay running. Um, what else? I've definitely got more reasons. That's it off the top of my head, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes. Right. That's. Right. So no. Yeah, that's that's another very yeah. That's definitely one of the most important, more important things. Um, we think if we go down the path of having a daemon, then you end up basically going to end up implementing an init system yourself. Which you know, we don't think everyone should be implementing their own init system. Uh, yes. So the question was, without a daemon, where does a metadata server sit? Um, what does it share between? Um, the lazy answer would be that it's implementation dependent. But what I would say is that generally we would expect it to be shared across uh, whatever you define your sort of container domain to be. So that might be, in some cases, that might be just a single machine. But generally, that would be your cluster. And so the, the, to some extent, it's a centralized service um, that, yeah. Because to provide that that uh, endpoint uh, identity endpoint, excuse me, then obviously the metadata servers need to be aware of all the different containers. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, so the question was, is there any kind of accounting plan f within Rocket? Um, no. Again, that's something that a daemon might provide, but we want to leverage existing things. So the thing which is on our roadmap um, for that would be integrating with uh, C Advisor, which is Google's um, uh, suite of, of sort of, of uh, accounting suite, I should say, to, look to, to monitor containers and statistics. So uh, we've actually worked pretty closely with them around this issue to make sure that we structure things so that we can basically just plug in with them out of the box. Okay. Yes? Um, that's a good question. The question was, if you have an is isolator that's not available on the host, how does it fail? Um, in Rocket, we would expect, we, well, that's not defined yet. It, it's not defined by the spec. So in Rocket, we would probably expect that it would fail hard. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been a little bit um, a little bit open about that in the spec. Yes? So, um, yeah, the question was, how would we handle logging? Would we handle that inside the container or use the service to push it out? Um, again, we yeah, we would we would expect that to be, I'm just going to pull up the spec because I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think we just define, oops, not available. Because I can't type. Uh, I think we just define it, yeah, for now we leave it up to the uh, executor um, with the option of an upgrade. Um, so within Rocket itself, we haven't really, um, we haven't really addressed that within Rocket itself. Um, what you would see is that since, for example, if you're running Rocket under System D, um, System D would capture the output, and so you could use, you know, the, you, use, you have all the power of the journal basically because you're just logging to logging to the journal. So you could forward it on using some kind of journal forwarding or pipe it to um, log stash and things like that. We sort of defer it to to, to a high level system. Anyone else? Nope. Feel free to come up and grab me afterwards. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.